through this super, super fast. Um, so the nature-based solutions guide and database. Um, I'll just see if I can move that guy. We don't even want you. Go away. There we go. Okay, so um, one of the things that we're doing in New World is to try and create this Oceania nature-based solutions guide database. So we're trying to make the nature-based solutions more a concept more contextualized and effective in Oceania. Um, and just make it a bit easier to use nature-based solutions, basically. Uh, we're also trying to highlight that there's a bit of a unique relationship between people and nature here in Oceania in that uh, they're, they're not separate <laughs> in a lot of cases. So um, a lot of thinking about nature-based solutions comes out of Europe, out of North America. So we're, we're trying to um, talk about a, a unique Oceania way of thinking about nature-based solutions. Um, again, trying to prioritize local and indigenous well-being in this. Uh, also to showcase some local case studies. Um, often, I know a lot of people in this room are designers, but for those who aren't, um, a lot of the time when we're designing something, we look at questions to try to figure out how to do something. Um, we're going to provide some link evidence requirements nature-based solutions um, through this guide as well. So um, this is going to be an online guide. It's available on our website. We've done one page out of about 100. This is like a demo for you today, basically. Um, we've come up with more than 100 urban nature-based solutions relevant for the Oceania context. Um, we've written about 60 to 70 of them, I think. Um, so we're trying to write a, quite a detailed case study about each nature-based solution. So sort of like a write-up of the solution itself. And then we're linking to an actual case study, hopefully in Oceania. Mostly we've done case studies in Oceania. Uh, we've figured out the structure and the categorization, and we think we should be able to get this finished and online in about late, late this year, hopefully. Um, so I'll just give you a quick demo. Um, I'm going to press this and see what happens. This is a this is a new computer today or something that they've just installed. Um, and there's some issues with connectivity. So luckily I prepared a version earlier. Um, these are some, oh wow, oh my god, it worked. Here we go. So this is our website. So if you come here to Nature Based Solutions Guide, hopefully this is not going to be too painful. Oh yeah. Um, and we decided that it'd be good if you could search in a few different ways. So to search for nature-based solutions by climate change impacts they're addressing, or by societal benefits that they might be addressing, or just the category of the nature-based solutions themselves, or by location, like you might be specifically looking for something which was done in Samoa or Tonga or whatever, and then an alphabetical list. So, um, here, this is kind of, yeah, it's an example. So with the climate change impacts, we, we did some literature review. We looked at um, things like the Oxford Nature-Based Solutions Database. There's a few databases out there, but none of them do what we're trying to do. But that's how we got this, um, this list of climate change impacts. So we've kind of categorized those. Here's one I prepared earlier, reduced water quality. So, um, within that category, like you might be designing something, you think, oh, I really want to do a nature-based solution that relates to reduced water quality. Then you could come here and we've given you a list of these nature-based solutions that we know of that address water, water quality. And the cool thing about nature-based solutions is that they often address multiple things. So you might see the same nature-based solution come up on different pages. Um, oh, look, here's one I prepared earlier. So woven mats or ufi. So um, we've written up a, a kind of an explanation of what this nature-based solution is, you know, what's its type, um, what ecosystem does it relate to, what's the location. We've um, come up with a description, just like to acknowledge Selena here who's done this one. Um, we've talked about relationship to indigenous knowledge for each of these, what the climate change benefits are, and what the societal benefits are, ecological benefits and biodiversity. And then um, this particular one doesn't have a lot of technical requirements there, but we've added that um, information in, or it's our intention to. 
and um, we've thought about issues and barriers, opportunities, financial case, where we can kind of find that information. Sometimes it's a bit tricky. Um, and then we've tried to provide some references and some further resources, just because um, designers might not care very much about that, but for people who are trying to um, use this as part of academic work or student work, then sometimes references are pretty useful, policymakers. And then at the bottom, we have a case study. So again, this one we prepared earlier. Um, and within that, we might have a video embedded or, um, or some images, but we're basically just trying to, in a very simple way, outline, you know, where, when, how big, who initiated it, who funded it, um, and to just, again, talk about what some of the main benefits are and just provide a bit of a summary and links to further information and so on. So um, that's what we have in mind for the Nature-Based Solutions Guide. And um, I'm gonna hand over now to Selena. So um, Selena Urshari is from AUT and has been working on this with Vicky and I, who have been coordinating this work. And she um, was funded by an AUT summer scholarship, which turned into a just AUT fund. <laughs> Um, we also have Amelia Platia here. Am I saying your last name right? Uh, you're saying it right now. Oh, great. <laughs> um, who is a VUW student who was funded by a VUW summer scholarship. And we also have Helene Van Leur here, who is a, um, an intern who's been working with me from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. So that these three, as, long, as well as Vicky and I, have been working on this. So I'll hand over to you, Selena. Thanks, Oh, yes. Yeah, please, please do move over. Um, Korokoko, uh, for Alpes, Albor, Simonga, for Tessian, Samoana, for Aran, Apple, uh, for Selena Oshadi, and Oshadi. Funny, I'm mispronouncing my own name. Oh, sweet. Oshadi, sweet. Um, uh, um, so I thought I'd just delve a little bit deeper into the case study that made it this show. Um, not too deep, we don't have a lot of time, but um, I think this is a really wonderful uh, NBS uh, case study, which is uh, a real uh, example of Makaranga uh, Māori design innovation and creation. It's very um, rooted in place. Um, and it's drawing on uh, a cultural tradition and bringing it into um, 14 in a really interesting way. Okay. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with this thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, Te Arawa Lakes Trust um, wanted to suppress or control and manage the uh, invasive aquatic weeds that have been introduced into the lakes. Um, I think it was primarily Lake Sikh and Lake Tarawira um, in the 1960s. And they have been managing the invasive weeds. I can't remember exactly with what, but not using Uthi. Um, and I think it was in 2021, like, during COVID, they um, came up with this really interesting method of strategy of uh, suppressing the weeds through the specific framework of Katakuri now, which um, really, I think, empowers the community through involving the community into the innovation, creation, and the testing, the trialing of the map. So local expert weavers, um, created the map and it also um, provided employment during the kind of acts of COVID um, and, and also really like enhanced the kind of um, uplifted this traditional practice, cultural practice and, and uh, keeps it alive in this really innovative way. Um, so I think this case study is a really, you know, a, an example of honoring security um, and, you know, the right 
to exercise similar kind of behavior and be really in charge of the strategy that is in place. Um, and for Māori and Indigenous communities to think about the in and their environment. Um, and now I will just get it a little different slide for a second. Okay. Um, and so, and, and then also because this Mataranga um, Māori, um, the international or project for people weaving in um, events, um, I think it's a real kind of um, exemplar again of what we thought of partnership. Um, and now I'm not entirely sure if this is the appropriate term to use in this context, but I was listening to a conversation with Dr. Kimura, um, the chemist from the citizen of Kadawara Nation, and um, and we're talking about this concept of two I see of seeing through one lens or yeah, one I see through the lens of indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and other I think of uh political science. Um, and so I think as many people over the last couple of days have spoken to with much more knowledge, embodied um, knowledge and experience than I, um, it really, you know, bringing these, weaving these two knowledge systems to be leads to more holistic, I think, so holistic and um, successful outcome. But I think ultimately they need to be by right. um, underpinning the UP project really is the concept, the model concept plus papa day. And I think this um this quote by Master Rina Kali it's really beautifully comes up the project in terms of the construction to to play out, I think, is uh, a different really than being uh, like the Almaty values being restricted in the environment. Um, the tears of emotion that Kaira and Maranga shed on the day came not from breaking the ground, but in basic wheat, or we were too far but from the obligation of obligation and responsibility to the Alba, to the Pinoa, to Kumerua. Um, and do I have time to say one more thing? Okay. Um, there's also this really beautiful description of the uh, being laid on the roof and the way that the fibers came to life. And it, it was a bit they were caressing in the world. And I thought this. Um, I think it really is an image that speaks to the um, the phenomenon time out with the phenomenon time between humans and more human and what a an, man was speaking to the to the sense of care yeah. yeah, and love um, and respect that um, we need to explore from the who we are junior to. Um and there's just something incredibly beautiful about placing a woven handkerchief and woven my hand that is for a permanent that not only is the attention to correct human thoughts, but open. I should probably wrap it up now, but I think we have yeah, um, thanks, Selena. So just with that case study trying to highlight that. Within the guide, we've been looking specifically for nature-based solutions, which you don't usually find in the in the sort of books about nature-based solutions, which come out of other parts of the world. We've tried really hard to find local examples of those and to sort of go beyond just a technical mm -hmm. approach. So I'm going to pass over to Amelia now. Um, so I'm a landscape architecture um, student, so I was coming from very landscape perspective over um, summer and what I was looking at. Um, and I was looking a lot at um, the urban infrastructure and the, at green and blue infrastructure in particular. Um, and I kind of found that there was a separating between the singular integrated nature-based solutions um, to the larger network. Um, 
not many case studies in the Oceania context I found were linked to a larger network, but there were opportunities to be able to link these singular nature-based solutions to a larger network. Um, and then I've just got um, quickly a little case study um, up in Auckland, so very close. Um, but looking at, there's a whole lot of projects um, very centre of Auckland um, and looking at different methods of blue and green infrastructure integrated um, and woven um, and highlighting different areas of nature-based solutions. Um, so there, where I was going with this is kind of linking it to in Asia, I was finding, I was looking at a particular um, nature-based solution, um, Sponge City, and I was struggling to find a specific, specific case study in um, Oceania that was reflected of a sponge city. And this is the closest I can find. And it is on the way to be, become a space, sponge city. Um, but yeah, there's my little bit at looking at case studies. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems my slides have fallen out, but that's okay. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Hiren. Uh, I'm an international student from the Netherlands uh, for the past six months. I've been lucky enough to be able to do an internship here with Neighbrit in uh, Aotearoa. Sorry. Um, and I've also been working on the new idea database. Now we'll have to think about short and snappy, uh, more technical analysis of working on a database. Um, it stood out to me that even though nature based solutions would have offered people co benefits, that when compiling a use case with Oceania, some benefits uh, were used, were created more often than other. <laughs> And uh, from memory, <laughs> these the benefits that I found that were created most often were the ones um, for example within the food production. Uh, no, it's not only food production land, it's also food production on um, Lana and the Awas. And this is for very important topic here in uh, Oceania. Also uh, dealing with uh, coastal inundation, storm surges, extreme weather events, which we've seen lately. A lot of nature based solutions kind of address the part, uh, lost biomass, the patient, something that is very apparent to nature based solutions as a concept. And there was another, oh, uh, reduced water quality was also something um, that was not very basically that we've studied thus far. Besides that, we also have. Categories, you can categorize the native wage solutions that we look at. These categories are management of soil, so the type of bigger overarching themes of the nature based solutions. And we found that the solutions here for the region are uh, a lot about fresh water, uh, about the ocean, about vegetation, uh, and about building integrated. You can tell there are a number of us involved on this project, and uh, I know Favorite was very patient with us, but I think some slides got lost. Hopefully, this is the correct one. Oh, no. <laughs> So what I wanted to do is take a step back um, from my admittedly limited Western perspective. Um, you know, a lot of um, other institutions and agencies have looked at nature-based, have looked at, you know, databases 
from ecosystem-based adaptation, nature-based solutions, as well as landscape performance. Um, and so I wanted to take this from the perspective of looking at the role of this guide in relation to, to, to these other types of guides. Thinking about, you know, just list, remembering back even just to when we started yesterday morning, um, thinking about the complexity and the overlapping layers of these projects, um, as well as the need to sort of make the case. We've talked a lot about community-based projects and needing to make the case and demonstrate the need to invest in these types of nature-based solutions. So, you know, just on the slide, on your, the image on your left, the Landscape Performance Series, which uh, with a nod to Jackie Bowering here at Lincoln, um, who's done the first Aotearoa case study for the Landscape Performance Series, but thinking about sociocultural, ecological, and econ economic performance, as well as IUCN's Kiwa project, which you heard of from earlier today. Um, Jackie and her team looked at a number um, of demonstrated performance for their project. I just wanted to highlight one example for each category, looking at carbon sequestration, sequ sequestering 239 tons of atmospheric carbon, um, looking at how much savings that is um, of carbon credits in the New Zealand carbon market, thinking about social impacts, um, producing fruits and herbs for resident consumption, um, surveying residents, to look at you know, who's harvested from the public areas um, and then economic impacts. And so these are all things, you know, regardless of whichever discipline we're coming from, the more we can gather case studies, um, and again, I admit this is a limited Western knowledge, but you know, when we think about trying to make the case to invest in types of projects to look at these um, types of performance examples when possible. In addition to that, you know, Mavert referenced how we were you know, one of our intentions was to go beyond just sort of looking at these metrics. And for these types of nature-based projects, really looking at the community-based approach. So what are some of the community-based approaches? What are some of the processes? What are the outcomes? And how can we start to gather these stories um, as part of looking at our nature-based solutions toolkits? Um, I wanted to keep this quick. <laughs> we're, we're at the very close to the end of um, our symposium, um, we still have a few more things to cover, but in terms of conclusion, one, the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity that we've seen, I've been really quite inspired the last two days, you know, people coming from so many disciplinary boundaries, from education, from marine scientists, from geomorphologists, to architects, um, to community activists, and I could go on, um, thinking across scales. And so regional, city, urban, neighborhood, site building, um, you know, thinking about the potential role, you know, who is this guide for? It's for a number of people, but it's also something that we're looking towards um, to all of you who've been attending this conference and your networks. Um, and so thinking of this as a potential role as a guide, but also, you know, something that we can learn from for you, for community supporters. Also thinking about the potential role of researchers. So we think about the need for making the case for these types of projects to support this. They, you know, we've demonstrated, there are so many demonstrated examples where it's worthwhile um, if you need to make the case if people aren't already convinced, um, as well as using this guide to develop future collaborations and support more of these types of projects throughout Oceania. It's been so wonderful, really, the last two days to hear about the breadth of all the different types of projects. Um, and then thinking about this guide is really sort of a almost a living resource, you know, that it's going to be developing, um, it's a developing resource um, it's developing guide, and it's something that hopefully we can all continue to add on. Um, so this leads us now to the next steps and thinking about how, you, you know, if it's not too much, we, you know, we've already given so much of your time and energy and attention and presenting to us, but to now think about what kinds of collaborations we can foster. If you have any other um, Oceana nature-based solutions and case examples, um, then I'm actually going <laughs> to... Yeah, sorry, I'll talk this slide. So, um, I'm just talking about here what will help us with the guide itself. So um, we know that we need to sit down and have a talk with IUCN and with Spret, who have got similar ideas for guides. Um, so we need to set those discussions up. So if you're from those organizations, let's do that, because I haven't been very good at setting those meetings up so far. Um, we're always on the hunt for more Oceania nature-based solutions and case study examples. So we've put a sheet up the back there. If you know of some good um, Oceania Nature Based Solutions or case studies, just, just drop them up there. We might know of them already, but we might not. Um, and if anybody wants to help us with technical website assistance side of things, just let me know because that would be great. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, acknowledging the two universities that helped to fund some of this work along with the Marsden Grant. 
Um, if you want more information, please feel free to contact me or Vicky and we'll, we'll pass you on to the right person. So um, that's the conclusion of our discussion about the guide. Um, and before we move on,